So the first thing we've got to do when we're um, looking for shale gas is to find perspective shale play. And the play is the term that we use to group together all the different uh, elements of a petroleum system. So source rocks, reservoirs, traps, seals, we just call that a play. And there's a whole number of things that go into that. So you've got to evaluate the rock, you've got to look at all data there, you get seismic data, you model the basin, you decide if there's any gas. Um, you do an awful lot of science before you decide, okay, I've got something I'm going to drill here. Then you decide to drill a well, you pick a zone, take an awful lot of data in that well, uh, and select zones to frack. Then, hopefully, you frack it and you flow some gas, and hopefully we can do that in the UK soon and prove that it's commercial. So uh, we've seen a slide earlier on um, the, uh, of what is a shale. Um, so shale, quite simply, is a fine-grained rock. People call it mudstone, claystone, uh, a variety of things, and that's really just a difference of the mineralogy. So a shale can contain quartz, feldspars, clays, calcites, lots of different chemistry, lots of different minerals um, in all different sorts of proportions. Uh, all these minerals affect the uh, chemistry of the rock, affect the mechanics of the rock, and are going to affect how we can frack it and how much gas is in it. If we compare it to what we call conventional reservoirs, um, sandstones and limestones, so at the top of this chart we have a coarse sandstone, so this might be a, a very nice reservoir. We've, on the, on the left hand, uh, what's, yeah, this column, um, the little scale bars are one millimetre, and in this column we've zoomed in a bit and the scale bars are 0.2 millimetres. So at the top here you can see the nice coarse <coughs> sandstones, big quartz grains, some smaller grains filling in the holes in between. We zoom in. Some of these uh, pore spaces are filled with clays, but there's other pore spaces there filled with oil. We go down, find sandstones. These still make lovely, nice conventional reservoirs. You can still see all the small grains. And if we zoom in a bit, you can see the grains and you can see the gaps between the grains, which are the nice pores. These are nice large pores, but they're all connected up and have nice permeability. Going down to siltstone, this is where we start getting into what's referred to as tight gas. Um, and you can see, you can just about see the grains there. When you zoom in, you can see them. But there's very difficult to see any of the pore space in between. And when we come down to shale, you know, you really can't see many of the grains here. And even when you zoom in, you can't see anything. <coughs> to, to see individual grains in the shale, you need to look at SEM, scanning electron microscope type images. Um, so really here, very, very little porosity and unconnected pores. So we zoom out a little bit. This is what a shale looks like, a sort of hand specimen size, something you'd hold in your hand. This is a, uh, this is a slice through a shale. The scale bar there is two centimeters. And you can see the, uh, the variability as we go through. So each one of these different colored layers has different uh, percentages of clays and quartz um, <coughs> and organic material. Generally dark um, minerals, black stuff is organic material and that's what we need to get the gas. Um, so this variability causes some problems for us as geologists in trying to predict where the good rocks are and uh, decide what we're going to target. <coughs> if we look at these rocks under different lights, um, so this is just normal light, and then this diagram here where the bright yellows, this is under fluorescent light, now, um, organic material fluoresces. And so all these bright uh, yellow specks on here, that's the organic material. And this rock is very rich, so about 20% of that is organic material. Um, normally, in, to make a, a good shale rock, you can 2 to 4% total organic content is, is enough. But that's, that's one thing that we're looking for. And, and you can see even on a very small section that there's different layers of, um, of shell content. So you know, we have to try and decide where, where those are all going to be from three kilometers above. If we zoom out even more into where you get shale deposited, um, you know, if we look at, um, so this is sort of like a 3D block diagram. And on this side here, this yellow bar, this is the land. 
And, you know, when you walk along the beach here, you've got sort of beaches, you've got rivers coming in, you've got estuaries and deltas coming out onto the shelf. This is all shallow water. And then you drop off into the main uh, the deep ocean basin. And out here, you're below the wave base. Everything's quite quiet. You get lots of fine-grained sediment. All of the plankton and little uh, creatures living in the sea die, sink down to the bottom, get buried, and that's where we get our shale rocks, our source rocks from. But if you look along here, you know, that's not all that's happening in that environment. You've got sediments coming off these slopes and being deposited down here. Uh, you've got uh, varying things happening along here, and that can happen over a couple hundred meters, kilometers. We're drilling horizontal wells that might go on for two, two kilometers. So the chances of having exactly the same rock along that whole length is, you know, that, that's, that's difficult. So that, that's a challenge that we have to, uh, we have to overcome and be prepared for when we're drilling. If we sort of uh, take another look at this. So imagine this, you're looking at a cliff section. So you're standing on the beach, you're looking at a cliff. This is actually three wells from the Barnet Shale in, in America. And uh, the geologists here have tried to join up uh, the shales in each well. So each different colour here is a different unit that can be tracked across. And yeah, it's complicated. Right? It's not, not all of the units go all the way across. So I don't know if I, if I drill another well here exactly what I'm going to get. Um, so that makes it difficult to predict what, what you're going to get in your well, uh, what gas rates you're going to get, how many fracks you need to put in, where they need to be. So a lot, you know, when you need to do a lot of evaluation to um, to work that out. We can take a lot of measurements of um, of the rocks, but uh, I know you can't uh, read this uh, very clearly. But it's really just to demonstrate that um, down here, these are all the different types of tools that we can run. These are the measurements we want to make, and the blue squares are direct measurements of an actual rock property and everything else has to be inferred or you need a couple of the tools to get that answer. And not all of these were designed for evaluating shale. A lot of them were designed for evaluating sandstones and limestones and you have to do a lot of tweaking with the equations to, uh, to get the answer that you want. And all these tools, I mean, by the, talking about the role of engineers, you know, engineers design these tools. It may not be mechanical engineers, oh, some of them will be because these tools have moving parts they go down. Uh, they go down the hole. They've got to work in complex environments, and you know we probably need some new ones, which are specifically designed for shale. And this is the type of panel that a geologist and petrophysicist looks at to decide where we want to put the fractures in the rock. We start here with some data that comes from uh, measurements from tools down the well. We perform a load of calculations, and we uh, get more logs. But really, this, this little panel here is, is what we want. These are sort of flags where green is good, yellow is not so good, red is bad, and nothing is, well, let's just not go there at all. So what we tend to do is, uh, well, what we're going to do in the UK anyway is take an awful lot of logs, an awful lot of data, um, decide what we're going to do in a pilot hall, pick our zones to drill our horizontals, take lots of data there, and pick our frac points. In America, um, they've done a lot of drilling and they haven't taken an awful lot of data in a lot of places. So there's a lot of data, but they don't necessarily take as much data all the time as we're going to because it's expensive. Um, so where do you find the gas? Well, this is, um, this <coughs> is something sort of similar to, uh, to what we've seen before, but the rock is made up, the sort of solid bits of the rock is made up of non-clay minerals, organic matter, clay minerals. And then the gaps between that is filled with clay-bound water, which we've talked a bit about, um, mobile water, and then the hydrocarbons. But the hydrocarbons are found in very, very, very small places. So this is a scanning electron microscope image. The scale bar there is 10 microns. And if we actually zoom in on one of these little black specks here, this is a one micron um, uh, scale bar there. This is a piece of organic matter. And in that organic matter are the pores. That's where the gas is. So we have to fracture, uh, shatter the rock to connect all of those pores and um, produce the gas. 
To select a target, we have to, uh, it's a really an iterative and integrated process with geologists and engineers of, of different types um, to try and uh, use all the data we have to classify different zones, rank all those zones, decide where to drill, drill, see if it worked, frack it, decide which one of those was best, and go back the circle again for your next well. So it's, um, so far we've uh, got to here. So we would like to get to here and, and actually go to here and do some frack zones and actually production test. Hopefully that will happen very soon. Ever the optimist. Um, so what do we get out after we drill the well? Uh, this is some uh, decline curves from uh, the Fayetteville shale play in America. And on the, this, on the vertical axis here is the gas production rates. And then across the bottom axis is years time. And these are different. This is five different wells. And you can see that this well, the green well here, is turned on, goes up to about uh, 70 million cubic feet. After one year, it's halved its um, production rate. Um, and this is quite typical of, of shale gas wells. And this is what makes it different from conventional wells. And sorry for the very simple curve, but it's uh, just meant to be illustrate a point. Um, where if I started turned on my conventional well here, chances are it's got a very much lower decline rate, maybe 10%. It might even plateau and stay, stay at this level for a long time before it starts to go off. Um, obviously, the area underneath this curve is the cumulative volume produced from the well. So you can see that you need a lot more shell gas wells to produce the same volume as conventional wells, generally. And I think what really makes unconventional resources unconventional is not the rocks. We've got, should we drill through shale rocks all the time? It's not the drilling. We drill horizontal wells. We frack wells. Um, it's actually more about how you develop them. So the conventional, for instance, offshore oil and gas installations, you spend all your money at the start, mostly. You know, you drill all your wells, you build a big platform, and then you turn it on. And you've got running costs and everything, but you know, most of your money spent at the front. You produce, and I have a nice plateau for a few years, and then you just decline slowly off into time. Uh, for shale gas, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, you can spread things out more. You've got to keep drilling wells to keep that production rate up because everything drops off a lot more fast. So, you know, we've just got to think about it a little, little differently. But then this is quite similar to most onshore, um, generally, wh whether, whether or not it's conventional or unconventional. You, you know, you can do things, you can do things a bit differently. So what do we need to make great shale play? Well, we need a combination of the geological, engineering, and economic factors. I think we've talked a lot today about sort of the economic um, factors, you know, land use and uh, env environmental costs and, and infrastructure. Um, I mean, engineering, we, you know, gas rates, pressures, gas composition, uh, geomechanics. Um, without the right geomechanics in the rocks, you, you can't make fracks. Um, and then the geology, you know, you've got to have a a good shale, nice thick shale, good gas contents, <coughs> spread over a nice wide area that's the right maturity and the right brittleness to frack. And every shale, every license is different. Everywhere has different rock properties. And, you know, the UK geology is complex. The UK surface, uh, land surface is complex, uh, land use. So um, I don't think we can come up with one set of rules that really Works for works for everyone. We have to evaluate everything everything separately. So, yeah, I'll sort of summarise um, the the sort of technical realities bit here. Um, so the shale rocks are very variable uh, laterally and vertically. Uh, they're difficult to predict, which means you know we might have to drill a few wells before this works and. Um, that's kind of a problem because we can't drill very many wells in the in the UK. Then you know that's that's going to be hard, you know, in in America and other places. You know, people have drilled lots of wells. It can take a lot of wells before you find or define even what the sweet spot is. Mm. Um, so you need a lot of specialist data, uh, technical expertise, and you know the data the data we need is expensive. It's it's difficult to acquire. Um, most of the geological techniques and petrophysical analysis, that's with the, the well log uh, data, was 
initially designed to evaluate something else. So we have to modify all of these equations. And it's really, it's quite tricky to select um, a target zone. I suppose it's a nice problem to have in the Bolan because we've got like 3,000 feet of rock and we've got to pick, uh, pick somewhere to go first. Um, it's a nice problem to have, but you know, we, we really do have to get this right um, first time. Um, and, um, but you know, all of these problems exist in what we call conventional sandstones and other reservoirs as well. And we're used to dealing with these problems, so hopefully uh, we will continue to do so. So I'll just finish up on the, um, on the communication. Uh, one of my uh, uh, bugbears, I suppose, at coming to uh, different shale conferences, and I haven't seen too many of them today, is um, pictures about shale gas which show a house the same size as the depth of the well and um, you know your fracks look you know the size of oh, huge and you've got these giant big water trucks and rigs um, so I quite like this one off the uh, off the BGS which shows this kind of puts it in perspective a little bit with your little horizontal well all the way down here um, you know th things like that if we make the newspapers use those rather than the ones they use that might help um, I mean, it was a good discussion uh, before, and I'm not sure I can add too much, but I mean, we need to talk to people. I, I know that it, people don't trust people from industry because apparently we're really evil and horrible, but we're not really. Um, <laughs> we're supposed to be quite nice. Um, but we just need to talk to people, explain the science. It's, you know, it's not, um, it, it's not difficult to explain it. It's just a lot of us are not used to explaining things to people who don't know anything about it, and we don't realize how little people know. Um, and we, I think we start in the wrong place. And we, you know, we need to go back to the basics earlier and explain actually what it is we do, what it's for, um, to try and demystify the whole thing. And yeah, there definitely needs to be more, uh, more information out there. I mean, if you, if you don't know, if you haven't made up your mind, and you go and Google fracking, you get, uh, well, a lot of bad information. Um, so, you know, we need to make it, and the industry needs to make that more available as well. I mean, we definitely need to have more on our company websites and make it, make it that all um, better. Um, and yeah, I think that's about all I was going to say. So I'll let you get on to your panel. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tiffany. Sit down.